I'm listening to this fascinating show. Uh, it's so nice on the radio that we can hear this professional and expert information, and I pay a dime. So nice. <laughs> now, uh, in listening to this uh, this program, which is it seems to be aimed at the whole man and healing, it strikes me, coming from my uh, theological uh, perspective, that, and I know this is going to blow minds, but I still, I just still want to tell the radio audience that Jesus Christ is the one that can take care of these tensions and that can help you and can be a shock absorber for you because we need a shock absorber just like a car does to take the shocks of this present age of spiritual blindness this age we're living in right now which I call the age of spiritual blindness and you need a shock absorber inside you to take up the shocks and to, to have that comfort which means the strength in Latin comfort means come for us with strength and Jesus Christ to me is the strength that's Romans 10.9, that I proclaim this to you, that he is the Logos, he is the divine Logos, that will heal us and will help us to stay whole and to absorb the shocks that come our way incessantly, especially around here, because the real estate energy around here is very intense. Washington, D.C. is growing, 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 and it's more intense, it's more metropolitan, and it's, they're tearing down the parks, man, like they destroyed a... Uh, a woods area uh, yesterday. Some guy was telling me that there was a little area for woods, and it was destroyed. And they're going to put up some apartment building. Hmm. So you need Christ. If there's, no, you know, with, with less Mother Nature around, it's even more. Your need for 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 the divine logos is even greater. Well, that's, that's a very interesting uh, theory, and of course, maybe the higher incidence in in uh, headaches and tension-related diseases, in some way related to the decline in the influence of religion. If you're a devout believer, regardless of what your religion is, it might provide you with uh, that release for tension. Would you say that, Dr. Satinsky? I think that the, the caller is fortunate to have this kind of inner strength to call upon and to have this type of belief. Unfortunately, I think a great many people don't have this resource available to them mm -hmm. so that they don't have this sort of belief and therefore they cannot call upon it when they need it. Well, thank you, sir. You're welcome. 686-2690. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Fred. Uh, that was an interesting point that the, uh, that the doctor had there a moment ago about warming the hands. I've been a migraine sufferer, I guess, or a headache sufferer since the age of 12. I'm now closing in on 60, but at about 35 years of age, they seem to get less in, in intensity, and now they respond very quickly to a single Tylenol, Tylenol. But you mentioned something about warming the hands. I've always had the Especially when I've had these headaches, my hands seem to get really icy. Do I just warm them? <clears throat> just, just heat them up? Is I, or was I wrong on uh, what you said before? Uh, it's true that the average, in fact, more than the average, the large majority of patients with migraine typically have cold, clammy hands a good deal of the time. Maybe even all of the time. Right, and I that, do have that a lot of the yeah, time. Yeah, and that the uh, the coldness and the moistness of the hands do get worse during a migraine attack. That's very characteristic. However, it's not sufficient to just put your hands into a basin of warm water or to put them over a radiator. That has been tried and is of no use at all. How it's about a uh, heating pad? Even a heating pad. The, the purpose of the training is not simply to get the hands warm, but to alter the remainder of the circulation. Don't forget when you... Um, when you have impulses coming from the brain that shunt blood into your hands, it's doing a lot of other things at the same time. And that's really probably where the relief comes from. Well, this is your biofeedback program, then, which yes. is a more complicated factor than just heating. Uh... That's true. But, you know, in all the years, you know, many years, as a kid at 12, uh, the headaches were very intense, sweaty, heavy sweating, nausea, throbbing on one side of the head, the next day the other side. About 35 of age, the intensity really slacked off. And then there became just headaches, which I get now, but they're really no problem. They respond uh, in about 20 minutes just lying still with one, one Tylenol. Is, it a, is this a normal sort yes. of trend? Yes. It's very common for migraine to diminish as you get older. Some patients then develop tension headaches in their place. I certainly hope that doesn't happen to you. Well, you know, I tell you, so you, you said hereditary. Nobody, the whole family, mother and father side, many brothers, sisters, nobody has this problem. In addition, nobody has any heart condition. I'm the only one. That's kind of strange. <laughs> just, just lucky. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, you're mean tonight. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you. Good luck. Okay, Fred. Okay. Six eight six twenty six ninety. You're on the air for Doctor Satinsky. Uh, Fred, I'd like to ask uh, the doctor about uh, sinus headaches. How how that is treated in uh, various okay. patients. 
Yeah, we didn't touch upon right. the um, the organically based headaches. We haven't said a word about them tonight. Uh, sinus headaches are, oh, I guess, one of the commoner types of headache that are really due to a physical disease. Um, the pain in sinus headaches doesn't necessarily have to be in the face where we know the sinuses are. It can be deep within the head as well. Be for one reason, there's a sinus in there. But uh, the pain may be behind one eye. It can be located um, in a variety of places. Um, the management of the sinus headache really is management of the sinuses. And that's, first of all, it's not a neurologist's province. I'm a neurologist. Uh, second of all, it, it would depend on how bad things were, how far the ear, nose, and throat specialist or the general practitioner would want to go. Is right. it curable? Oh, uh, sure. Yes. Okay, thank you a lot. Okay, thank you. 686-2690. WAMU, hello, you're on the air. Okay, it's my turn. I was trying to listen to the same by the volume. Um, yeah, I'm a migraine patient. Uh, I have a dichotomy here. I've been fascinated. I was coming home from work and it didn't pick up in the beginning of it. How about the, the environmental factors versus the emotional factors? You know, when I was diagnosed in the 60s, oh, well, you got migraines. And uh, I was told it was more or less psychosomatic. You're doing this to yourself, which is, you know, the route the conversation is going. Cause you, Maybe have a physical predisposition for this, uh, as the last guy just said, was in his family. Uh, my particular environmental factors are that I'm allergic to like millions of things, and I only get migraines during my the allergy seasons when I can't breathe and I have sinus problems. I know what sinus headaches are, but they're different than migraines. I don't feel the particular bottom when I'm by stress. Uh, but that could be because I also find that I can redirect I don't know about biofeedback redirect things to other parts of my body my migraines have diminished considerably through two things one doctor actually went through a series of them who said I think it's your allergies and you've got vasoconstriction and he gave me a medication which the I'm sure the doctor's familiar with called Belagol Space Tablets all the doctors before gave me stuff that knocked me out for three days it took away the pain, but I couldn't function. This stuff just dilated my blood vessels, and uh, when I feel the early symptoms coming on, I take them. I can avoid the migraine. Maybe I'm, I'm lucky in that yes. sense, but I'm trying to figure out whether I'm psychologically <coughs> predisposed, because now when I get a, have an emotional stress, I have gastro... <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, what do you think, Dr. Satinsky? Well, you're lucky that you found a pill that works, first of all. Not everybody does. Uh, secondly, what you're saying... Oh, did I? It, it does work? Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, you found a pill that works, and that's very nice. Um, the, the story of having been told in the past that it's an emotionally-based thing and you're doing it to yourself um, was a rap that was laid on women with migraine in the past, and I think it was particularly harsh and uncalled for. Oh, wrapped it up in pretty packages. She said, oh, well, you're above average and, you, you know, you're ambitious and all the most capable people in the world, this is a disease of, of overly gifted people. And I thought, well, uh, excuse me, I thought that was not really <laughs> uh, a very good way to talk to me about a problem I was having at the time. Well, I think that nowadays we are de-emphasizing the importance of the personality of the patient, although I, th I think it still plays some role. And we're recognizing, as you've pointed out, that there are a lot of other environmental stresses. I was very interested in your allergy thing because I find mine seasonal. Mm. There, well, was a, there was a time, wasn't there, Doctor, when we tended to look upon people who suffered headaches as weaklings of some sort, you know? People are still uh, self-conscious about the diagnosis of migraine and, and won't tell their colleagues and don't want me to put it on the insurance form, for example, because it's an indication yeah, of personal courage, weakness. Like a badge of excellence. Mm. That's well, a, you have migraines, you're above average. Well, I didn't buy that then, and I don't buy it now. Well, listen. If you tell me people in the ghetto are having migraines, I know that is not a fact. You know that is not a fact? I assume that it's not a fact if you tell me people in the ghetto are having migraines. Well, yeah, it, right, they are, of course. It was a mark of the upper class. I, I don't feel that that was like ulcers are supposed to be. Come on. Right. You're, you're, you're right, if I understand you correctly. Migraine pervades all social strata, all economic strata. You're absolutely right. All right. Listen, thank you very much. Glad you're doing better. Thank you.
686-2690. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, thank you, Fred. Um, the doctor, I only get headaches when I sleep too long, 12, 14 hours or something. Now, what causes these things from oversleep? Uh, I understand from uh, someone told me once it was due to a blood vessel expansion. Is this true, and how can they be avoided or cured? I, I couldn't answer your question without knowing more about you. It would take a while, actually, to elicit the proper history. Well, I, I noticed a lot of people uh, that tell me that they do get headaches after they sleep too long, especially when they stay up or they're drinking the night before and they get a, they sleep too long. You know, they get and in the morning when they get up, they got a they got a headache, and that's sometimes the only kind of headache they get. Right. Don't forget the drink the night before and the staying up late the night before. If yeah. that's part of the story, that's a very important part. Yeah. There are many reasons for, for headaches when you wake up in the morning. Uh, as you've indicated, you may have done something different the night before, and that's why you slept late. And it may be the night before that gave you the headache. Uh, secondly, migraine patients very often have their headache when they first awaken. A cervical spine disease, cervical arthritis, particularly if uh, you're not matched exactly for the bed and the pillow, or if you're sleeping in the wrong position, you will wake up with a headache in the morning. And the longer you're in bed, of course, the greater the risk. Well, what is it about the, uh, about a headache uh, uh, phenomenon that makes the head ache? Is it, is it uh, blood vessels? That, uh, is it, uh, it's pain, of course, in the nervous system, but what causes the pain? Is it expansion of, of the blood vessel or contraction or what? There, there are many causes. As we've indicated earlier, in migraine, it's expansion of the arteries. In tension headache, it's contraction of the muscles. And then there are a whole host of disease processes, which some of which have been mentioned, sinus disease, um, and a variety of other diseases that can yeah. cause pain. I read a, an interesting article in a magazine not too long ago about what happens in the migraine headache, that first there's a constriction followed by a dilation, right? Isn't that That's true. That's typical, yes. Uh, whether you experience the symptoms of the constriction depends on the artery involved. Uh, but the migraine patients who suffer the neurological deficit, the loss of vision, the paralysis of one side, things like that, they are experiencing um, ischemia or loss of partial loss of blood flow to some part of their eye or brain as a result of the constriction of the artery, which is the first phase of migraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, is the treatment there then the expansion or contraction of the blood vessel? Or could, do you affect it that way? It, it, if that's the cause, yes, it can be dealt with that way. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 686-2690. Good evening. Uh, hello. Uh, I've had uh, migraine headaches uh, ever since I can remember, which is about seven years old, with the uh, flashing lights and so forth and so on. Uh, and I've been on a regular saga through life. I'm now in my early 50s. Um, I have uh, recently come across, for the first time, uh, some promising help. But first I want to say that I um, have found that uh, the um, traditional medication, like ergotamine, I believe is enormously harmful. And I don't understand why doctors don't warn patients, especially when patients are likely to take this medication for years, like, like 10 years. And these medications um, in various uh, forms, uh, uh, Cafago and so forth and so on, uh, can cause um, serious um, blood um, uh, uh, flow problems, uh, gangrene at, at, at its worst. Um, and so that I have gone through all these uh, treatments, propanolol, um, a Jenner gym, and uh, all of that sort of thing. And it has only recently uh, uh, been helpful to me, uh, whereby a small study taking place at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., by uh, a doctor who is on a NIH grant, uh, Dr. Fennard, doing some studies uh, finding out that uh, people with migraine have low blood heparin and that supplying this uh, heparin through a simple inhalation method um, is helpful and I have truly found it helpful. However, even more than that, I have had a new experience uh, uh, which um, focuses on uh, diet uh, with the idea that um, um, uh, they, uh, that uh, those foods that one takes in 
that one's body cannot uh, tolerate then uh, uh, ultimately become toxic and that it's the toxins that have something to do with um, uh, with, uh, with, it, with a, in this case, in my particular case, case migraine headache. Hmm. Uh, also, getting the body in better shape. In my case, it was found that I had very um, a, a, um, a low minerals, and um, uh, attempting to um, uh, alleviate that problem has also been a help. Yeah, let's ask the doctor to comment on what you've said, ma'am. Well, what, what you're basically saying, I think, is that there are many factors, and in a given patient, one factor may be more important than another, and furthermore, that one medicine may work in one patient, which won't work in others. That's certainly true of the heparin. Don't think that everybody with migraine is going to get relief with heparin. That's not true. It's been studied in the past. Um, but it's true. It's a very idiosyncratic kind of ailment, and it's a very personalized form of treatment that the doctor has to reach. Why will uh, one medication work on one migraine sufferer A and not on migraine sufferer B? Do we know? I don't know. Does it have to do with the person's body chemistry, assuming the, the etiology is the same? Well, migraine must uh, express itself a little differently in each case, I would have to say. Mm -hmm. that's, that's different from, you know, the way antibiotics work, for example. We know that virtually everybody who has a, a given bacteriologically caused disease who is treated with a, a particular antibiotic will respond. Well, it used to be true, maybe, but even that's not true anymore. No. Well, let me say that um, um, with various medications, there had been a, a small initial period in which I felt better. That was true of uh, the ergotamine, that was true of the uh, propanolol, that was true of the gynogen, uh, but uh, it was short-lived, after which it was followed by some really weird symptoms. Now, um, if, as you say, um, uh, it's a very specific thing within uh, an individual uh, that uh, may be the cause of the, uh, of the headache, how is it that uh, these medications, uh, um, and I, I, I even don't even want to call them medications, really, they just kind of alleviate symptoms. Yeah. How is it that they do... They do initially um, uh, uh, give some some relief. Okay, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Our body has a way of uh, adapting to not only uh, uh, the real world but the chemicals that we put into it. And if we put in a chemical often enough, uh, the body may react in such a way to return the original condition in spite of the medicine. And that may explain why, after a while, the medicines don't work for you. All right, 686-2690, good evening. Hello, Fred. Hello. Dr. Stepinski? Yes. I've had a headache for two years now, and I think I know what's causing it. I have, an, and I want you to tell me if I'm right or not. I have an aggressive tongue in my mouth. and A, a what kind of tongue? Bridge. That tongue's always wrapping itself around my bridge. I think I strained my head and it caused me to have a headache. Could that be? You're saying that you have some kind of movements of your tongue with respect to your bridge? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, uh, I, I can't comment on that. I'd have to s really see your mouth and your tongue and your bridge to make any comment. Okay. Thank you. 686-2690. Hello. Hello, Dr. Satinsky. Hello. Um, I've had a head uh, history of headaches, tension-type headaches, for about 25 years, and I finally tried biofeedback treatments, and the very first treatment gave me relief. Hmm. Uh, I thought, this is just wonderful. I want one of these machines. The therapist kept saying, um, are you practicing at home? And I'd say, well, yes, and um, I think so. And But can I get one of these machines? And she'd say, oh, no, I don't think you need the machine. You just want to learn uh, the technique, and then you don't need the machine. Uh, so um, my course of treatments was very wonderful, and I had uh, some daily headaches or several headaches a day. I, I had no headaches at all for four to six months. And then they started creeping back. And I think maybe I wasn't um, 
it's hard to remember what we did when we were doing the <laughs> feedback. Um, I'm back now. I wake up with one every morning. I was awfully interested in the comments about morning headaches because I don't have migraine, but I still wake up in the early morning hours with a headache every morning. And um, it, they usually come back during the day. Uh, should I keep going back for a, another series of biofeedback treatments? They're pretty expensive. Or, or what is the solution? Uh, you know, am I just hopeless? Am I always going to have them? I hope you're not hopeless. The, uh, the experience you have is shared by some others, and it will not take a whole course of biofeedback. It may take one or two sessions to refresh your memory as to how to do it, to make sure you're able to do it correctly, and then you can practice at home as you presumably were doing originally, and I think the problem should be alleviated again. There's no uh, reason why you shouldn't do just as well the next time in just one or two sessions. Now, there is the possibility that this type of headache you're experiencing is different from what you had before, so you might want to consider seeing your physician again also. I see. Can you comment any further about early morning tension headaches? Well, tension headaches, uh, the word tension is being replaced by and large by the words muscle contraction headache mm -hmm. because uh, they don't always associate with emotional tension. For example, people who are depressed and who don't feel at all tense can have headache and uh, uh, that's an example, in fact, of an early morning headache. Depressed people generally have their worst headache when they first awaken. I'm not suggesting that you're depressed, but that there are uh, other reasons for headache besides simple tension, and maybe you should return to your physician if this headache is different from the others. I see. Oh, I had one other thought. Do you think it possibly could be a low level of blood sugar that early in the morning, and if would it be worth trying drinking or eating anything late in the evening or during the night? Uh, yes, it could possibly be related to low blood sugar. And no, eating something late at night will probably only make the situation worse. If you want to explore that possibility, you could get a blood sugar in the morning, directly after you wake up and before you eat anything. I see. All right. Good luck, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. 686-2690. Hello. Uh, yes. I'd like to ask the doctor about aspirin. And is it true that it makes your stomach bleed? It might. It might? Well, in some people it does. Uh-huh. But it's not common with everybody. That's true. Uh, are there any aspirins that are better than others or that may not cause that? Well, there are aspirins that are mixed with other things that hopefully reduce the tendency for bleeding, such as bufferin, as an example. Okay. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Is aspirin still far and away the most widely used remedy? Yes. For tension headaches. Can I give you one interesting statistic? Yeah. In New York City, there are 10,000 aspirins sold every minute. Wow. Wow. Do they have any effect at all for, on migraines? Yes. In some people, that's all it takes. Is that interesting? Mm -hmm. I, I was under the impression for some reason that uh, aspirin was useless in the case of migraines. It depends on the severity of the problem. In childhood, aspirin works in migraine better than it does in adults. But there are even some adults who have migraine, which responds to aspirin. What does that uh, tell us? The fact that it works in childhood is, do we develop some sort of uh, resistance or immunity to, to aspirin as we grow older, or does it have I, something to do with the nature of the headache? I think the severity of the problem just increases, that's all. Yeah. WAMU, hello, you're on the air. Hi. Um, concerning biofeedback, I'd, I'd like to ask whether... Um, uh, it's possible, particularly for musicians and people who are in situations of um, um, great emotional pressure, whether there's some sort of biofeedback um, system that could enable you to get control of your responses to the point by, say, reinforcing um, a very calm state where you could get up on stage and and recreate that. Yes. Um, there's a an ancillary technique... Um, called desensitization, which is a psychiatric tool, actually, in which when used in conjunction with biofeedback, uh, the patient is initially trained to be totally relaxed in a secluded, uh, very safe environment. And then the therapist uh, will make suggestions 
to the patient that he is uh, out in front of an audience playing his guitar or whatever your instrument is, uh -huh. and, uh, and the patient then has to imagine he is there and maintain the state of tranquility which he had already developed. What sort of equipment would be used in conjunction with this GSR or EEG or what? Uh, mostly EMG, electromyographic feedback, has been particularly helpful for that sort of problem. That's what the mus that's muscle that's muscle, muscle tension feedback. You can use GSR uh, as well, but it hasn't had the same clinical usefulness. Um, I wonder, I missed the first part of the show, so I really don't know what you said about biofeedback, but uh, first of all, um, is it available? Is it for sale in this area? And second of all, are there clinics? Like, do you run a clinic that uses it? Uh, I don't run a clinic that uses it. We have biofeedback in our office. We've been doing it for five years uh -huh. um, for specific, um, generally medical indications. Um, there are other places in the city and around the city that use biofeedback. It, it's generally better to do it under supervision rather than just go out and buy a machine because there are some tricks to this trade, and it's helpful to have a trained therapist uh, guide you. Uh -huh. well, do, key, is there, really. Are there programs, for instance, do you have programs that would be what I mentioned in terms of uh, um, emotional control for musicians. We've done things like that. We don't have a specific program for that, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, I'd like to talk to the doctor. Go ahead, we only have about two minutes. Oh, yeah. Doctor, I, for, since I was 10 years old, I, what I believe was uh, suffering from migraine headaches. But when I came to this country, the, the doctors didn't believe it, so they took some tests and they found out it wasn't migraine, it was a, some kind of seizure. And yet I get all the symptoms of a migraine headache, like visual disturbances and um, upset stomach. Uh, and I wondered what the association with that was, with um, seizures and my... my uh, let's let, let, let the doctor answer what you've asked because we're running out of time. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm not sure that I could comment on your particular case, but in general, uh, I would like to say that a significant percentage of patients with classical migraine headaches have an abnormal electroencephalogram and that the electroencephalogram may mimic in many respects that seen in patients with epilepsy. So it's possible at least to misinterpret what the patient is telling the doctor because the EEG suggests that it's epilepsy. Um, nevertheless, the diagnosis of migraine rests, uh, frankly, entirely on the history and if you have a classic story for migraine, that's what you've got. Now, one other comment, sometimes migraine responds to anticonvulsant medications, which only serves to complicate things. Thank you. Well, all our lines are backed up, Dr. Satinsky. Would you stand by through a few minutes of news and take some more calls? All right. Dr. David Satinsky, a neurologist. This is Fred Fisk. We'll be back. WAMU-FM, Washington. I mentioned something that I had read someplace, that we in America experience more headaches than people in other parts of the world. What does that tell us? Does it tell us something about our way of living? Is it more tense than others? Or? I'm not sure that's true. Uh, there was a very interesting Swedish study, which is where I, I got my best data on childhood headache. And in that study, which I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, a full 75% of 15-year-olds complained of headache, recurrent headache. Uh, and compare that with the data that's usually offered in this country that 70% of Americans have headache. So I think you'd have to agree that at least in Sweden, headache is as common as in this country. So I don't think we have, we have cornered the market yet on headache. I think it's probably commoner in, uh, in the Western world, probably because of the pace and the, and, uh, the, the living conditions that set up tensions. Mm -hmm. All right. 686 26, nine. before I go through, one further thought occurs to me. By far, the overwhelming majority of ailments that you doctors deal with become uh, greater problems with advancing years. This is one of the few in which the problem diminishes. Yes. Certainly for migraine, yes. Yeah. 686 26, 90. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I have two questions for the doctor. Um, I've been getting headaches for about 12 years, and I can almost always tell when I'm going to get the headache because I get a tingling sensation in my scalp, and uh, I get really pale for about two seconds. But I don't get the headache for about six hours later. What I want to know is exactly what's happening to my body when I get that tingling sensation. Well, of course... That's a very sketchy story, and I couldn't really be sure of, of what I could tell you, but it's uh, certainly common enough for people with migraine 
to suffer uh, some uh, prodromal symptoms uh, even hours before the headache begins, and pallor is reported to be one of the prodromal symptoms in some people. And uh, furthermore, you are female, I assume, yes. and um, have had recurrent headaches for quite a few years so that you're a prime candidate for migraine, and um, therefore it may all fit together into that package. Okay, the second question was, I've been taking Emperor number three uh, for about six years, and it's working fine, but I switched at one point to Tylenol number three, and it didn't work at all, so I went back to Emperor number three. Is there something in Emperor number three that's different that would help the migraines? Yes. Um, in Emperin, with or without codeine, is aspirin, phenacetin, and caffeine. Now, aspirin does have an effect uh, that Tylenol does not have, and furthermore, caffeine is a mild vasoconstrictor, which therefore is good for migraine. And there are a lot of people with migraine who will benefit from Emperin, even just over-the-counter Emperin, who will get no relief from Tylenol because of the difference in the chemistry of the two drugs. So the codeine wouldn't make a difference? The codeine? Uh, is that what you said? Right. It's the same. It, it, they, that would be the same amount of codeine in both pills. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. I'd like to ask the doctor to comment in his capacity as a neurologist on diagnosis of migraines, and I'd like to preface what appears to be a silly remark with the uh, comment that I suffered for 15 years, uh, debilitating or incapacitating headaches, and I saw doctors in this country, in Switzerland, and in England for them. And uh, the problem was finally solved when a dentist pointed out that I had very large sinuses and asked if I had sinus headaches. And these uh, incapacitating headaches are cured by non-prescription Sudafed, which after 20 minutes eliminates the headache. 